Good evening. Welcome to the webinar, uh, The Public Health and Healthcare Implications of COVID-19. My name is Tim Bruckner. I'd first like to introduce our Dean of Public Health, Bernadette Bowden-Albala. Uh, thank you, Tim. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us this evening to this great event. As uh, Dr. Bruckner said, I'm Bernadette Bowden-Alballer, and I'm the director and founding dean of the program in public health. I'm thrilled that all of you can join us and hear from our wonderful panel tonight. Tonight's panel on public health and healthcare implications of COVID-19 is organized by the Center for Population Inequity and Policy, a new center uh, or under uh, the auspices of the School of Social Sciences and the Program in Public Health, which is focused on advancing research on socioeconomic factors that directly impact inequity. Tonight, our panel will be discussing healthcare implications of COVID-19. With the onset of the coronavirus, we've all heard the news about the burden it's put on our healthcare system, from a lack of personal protective equipment to health to hospital bed shortages, uh, to race ethnic disparities that's created, to a race to create a vaccine, all these impact on how we receive care and administer care. So without further ado, I want to turn things over to our moderator, our distinguished faculty, professor of public health and co-director of the Center of Population Inequity and Policy, Dr. Tim Bruckner. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Bernadette. And yes, I'm also very excited about uh, listening to the panelists and also to your questions. And so I will first introduce the panelists. Uh, we will uh, begin with Andrew Neumer, who is an Associate Professor of Public Health here at UCI. He will discuss population level responses to COVID-19 and reflections from early in the pandemic. Then we'll continue with Dr. Daniel Parkner, who is Parker, who is an Assistant Professor of Public Health also at UCI. Uh, in, and he will present some preliminary results from an analysis that's looking at spatial patterns of testing and reported cases of COVID-19 in Orange County. Uh, then we will move to Professor Dana Mukamel, who is a professor of medicine here at UCI, as well as in public health and nursing. And she's, going, she's also the director of iTech, which is the Translational Technology Enhancing High Quality of Care uh, group. She will speak tonight about COVID-19 in nursing homes. And then we're going to have special guests, uh, Ed Kasich, from, who's the president of Irvine Health Foundation. He will talk about the impact of, on our community and the challenges to our community-based organizations as a result of the COVID crisis, including the response from grant makers to help organizations and individuals impacted by the crisis. And then we will conclude with Dr. Stephanie McClellan, who is the chief medical officer of Tia Women's Clinic and the author of So Stressed, The Ultimate Stress Relief Plan for Women. She will talk about her clinic's recent experience with telemedicine and what it might mean for healthcare. After we have the panelists give their presentations, we will have open responses by the panelists if other information by panelists has led them to uh, respond. And then we will finish with Q&A session from the audience. So, Throughout the session, we invite the audience members to solicit, to, to give questions to us through the Q&A uh, button on your Zoom room. So if you scrolled to the bottom panel, um, it's the Q&A button. And if you press it, you can type in your question and we will then uh, listen, we will then have that question documented and provide ample time for answering questions at the end of the session. And then we will conclude at 7 p.m. So that is the structure. We're excited you're here. Without further ado, let's begin with Professor Neumer. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Bernadette. Thank you uh, to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you for supporting the uh, CPIP, the Center for Population Inequality and, po and Policy, and thank you for supporting UCI Public Health, thank you for supporting UC Irvine during this time. Uh, there's, I'm going to be talking about an overview of some population-based uh, reflections I've had during the pandemic, and I don't have a lot of time, and it's a big topic, so let me start by sharing my screen so we can get started here. Okay. And I'm a, a medical demographer and epidemiologist, and I've been following uh, 
this pandemic for uh, quite closely for quite some time. Um, this was something I tweeted in January. Um, and this was actually after I had spent two weeks um, trying to interest people in the severity of what was coming up and finding that uh, at that point in time, m most people weren't very interested uh, in, in that and um, tried to explain to me that it was going to be a lot like a, f a flu season. Um, well, we, we know it's not a flu season and it's, it's a pandemic in fact. And uh, this is just a, the slide is just a reminder that the, 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 the demic in a, in a pandemic or epidemic, it comes from the ancient Greek uh, demos, it pe means people. And uh, it's what demographers, uh, it's the same root as the word demography. So it's, 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 a, it's something that's, you know, it, it literally means upon people, but it's important that we not lose sight of the, the, the people angle and that it's not just about a virus, it's about the people that it affects. And it's important to think in terms of people because this is gonna uh, have the potential to affect all of us before it's said and done. So in, in December, 2019, everyone in, in the whole world was immunonaive uh, to, uh, to this virus, the SARS-CoV-2. The whole world was immunonaive. So that mean, that's unlike any other infectious disease that we have experienced with. It's unlike flu, it's unlike you know, measles, it's unlike HIV, it's, it's different. And that's going to govern how it affects us. And demography uh, provides such a valuable perspective here because a lot hinges on the denominator. The, the denominator is sort of all of us this time, not like a typical flu season where one third of the US population is, gets a vaccine every, every fall and a, a very substantial po uh, portion of the population has cross immunity from previous flu strains that they um, were infected with. Nobody has prior immunity to um, SARS-CoV-2, at least, at least as of uh, last December. Of course, by now, uh, it's probably some 20 million Americans uh, have immunity to it. Um, so the, the final size is gonna, is gonna govern a lot. And uh, the final size is simply the number of people who will get this before it, before it goes away or be, before it becomes an endemic phase. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a, in a minute. But um, there's going to be basically three stages uh, of SARS-CoV-2 emergence um, to endemicity. And uh, we're not going to be in this crisis stage forever. So um, I've... I've uh, I've acquired the moniker Professor Dark Cloud for my, um, what, what I prefer to think of as realistic approach to, um, to the pandemic, but be that as it may, like I'm here to tell you uh, right now that you know, we're not gonna be in this crisis phase forever. Uh, we're in the emergence and, and pandemic phase and we're here now, and we're, we're gonna be here for you know, 12 to 48 months, I think, uh, depending on many things. Now I should say that, uh, a, success, uh, a successful, safe, and uh, available vaccine will interrupt this scheme. But, um, but as of you know, right now, that doesn't exist. So uh, let's just keep going. Uh, af after that, uh, there's going to still be COVID, but it's going to be like something that happens in the wintertime. It will acquire seasonality after the pandemic phase. And then in the long run, I do expect that COVID will remain as just a nuisance disease something that causes the common cold, like the other coronaviruses that we, that we have experience with. And we saw in the 1918 flu, which was the, the first, well, we, we believe the first emergence of H1N1, you know, the, that strain of flu was the, the seasonal flu from 1919 until 1957. The 1918 flu didn't go away, it just faded away. It didn't disappear, it just faded away. So the same thing will happen with COVID-19, with SARS-CoV-2. It won't, it won't be a, an acute phase forever, but um, you know, a, a sort of a heuristic for, um, for when we transition from the emergent phase to the, to the post-pandemic uh, phase will be when these two lines cross. 
the red line on top and the black line. Is, and that, that will be when the, the lines cross. This is something I tweet every day, once, once per 24 hours. This is called the mini model. The mini model assumes a 70% final size of the US population with the infection fatality rate being the case fatality rate, the, death to, the current death to case ratio divided by 10. And the death to case ratio is updated daily as are the deaths in the black line. So uh, as it stands now, the, uh, the mini model would predict, although it's not really necessarily a prediction, it's more of a heuristic. In the q and I can talk a little bit more about the distinction between a heuristic and a, and a prediction. But the, it would predict so-called uh, 1.28 million deaths from COVID-19 during the pandemic phase. And that doesn't have a time envelope. That is uh, between now and whenever. It's not calendar year 2020. Uh, when the, the actual deaths reach 1.28 million, then the pandemic phase is over. The two lines cross. Now, the red line has been going down of late and the, these lines are not destined to, to surpass a million before they cross. Um, as you can see, the, the number of deaths has been slowing and the red line has, has been very subtly going down. So that's why I update this daily. The death to case ratio has been declining a, a lot in the United States. That's great news. We can talk uh, more later about some of the reasons for that. I do expect a more robust fall wave of uh, coronavirus cases. And there are no Andrew, coronavirus uh, just a cases. Heads up, Andrew, it's a, if you could uh, make some concluding remarks, that yeah. would be great. There are, there are no coronavirus uh, cases um, without uh, deaths. So uh, there will be more uh, cases as we open up the economy and therefore some deaths. Thankfully, the death to case ratio is uh, declining. So hopefully uh, in the land of trade-offs as we are now, we can uh, slowly and carefully open up the economy without experiencing as severe a uh, mortality as we were seeing in the early days of March and April. I look Great. forward to hearing the other presenters. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. I uh, appreciate it. And now we will move to a perhaps more local perspective for the 3 million residents of Orange County. Uh, we'll have Daniel Parker with his presentation. Daniel, to you. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, so let me let me share my screen here. And somebody, please tell me if it is not working. So, so I am I'm a spatial epidemiologist. Um, I, I work with infectious diseases most of the time, most of the time in the tropics. Um, but nobody's letting me fly to the tropics these days, so I might as well be mapping out infectious diseases in my backyard. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, with, uh, with, with some um, collaborations that Dean Bernadette has, uh, has set up for us, I've been working with Orange County Healthcare Association um, and uh, kind of mapping out where the cases are uh, and, and where the testing is being done um, over time in, in Orange County at the zip code level. Um, so, so what I've got are some simple, I think they're simple maps, um, and I split these off by months. So, so March, the cases kind of really started taking off here mid-March, right? And so what I'm mapping here, um, this is the number of cases per 100,000 people per week. And it, it, it runs from, uh, the color ramp here is from yellow up to uh, kind of a dark blue or almost purple color. Um, the yellow being uh, really low cases, almost no cases, um, and the, the dark blue being where the higher cases are, right? So, so in March, this is what you're seeing here. You can see that the cases are, are, are basically clustered along the coast, right? So these are, um, I, I think, uh, are more affluent communities um, uh, along the coast. So Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, those areas. As we moved into April, the pattern shifted um, further north, um, kind of dispersed a little bit. Um, and now in May, we're starting to see some clustering up in the north and uh, uh, especially around, uh, I guess that's in Anaheim area there, right? 
So, so these, these data can't be taken just by themselves, though. You really need to consider what's going on with the testing at the same time, right? Because we all know, um, if we're listening to the news or paying attention to the situation, um, the tests were quite limited at the beginning. Um, and so what I'm doing here on the top row, if you guys can see that, those are the, the same three maps that I just showed in the, in the previous slides, um, showing the, the, the case incidents, so the reported case incidents, number of cases per 100,000 people per week. And, and along the bottom, I'm showing testing intensity. So it's the number of tests that are being done per 100,000 people per week. And at the beginning, um, you lose a little bit because it's kind of gone off the charts. You lose a little bit of granularity because it's, 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 it's pretty high now. Um, but at the beginning, um, the places that had the highest testing are also the same places where you had the highest case incidents, right? So, so those are the places along the coast there, uh, Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, um, where you also had the highest, highest case reporting. Um, afterwards, testing spread throughout the county, um, and now it's less predictive of where, of where we're actually seeing uh, uh, we're actually seeing cases. So, so my interpretation of what's going on now, this is, this is quite preliminary still. We're doing some analyses with looking at uh, different socioeconomic factors, um, ethnicity and different things. Um, but my, my interpretation of what we saw in Orange County so far is at the beginning, um, we saw these cases in influence societies. One, partially or perhaps because some of them probably were traveling more, uh, may have been in places like in, in, in Italy and uh, other places in Europe where there were uh, high caseloads, a raging epidemic at the time. Um, but also uh, access to testing was not homogeneously distributed across uh, Orange County. So um, at the beginning, it's possible that people in those communities and more affluent communities were more capable of accessing testing. Right. And this, this can drive the dynamics. Over, over time, this, is, this has changed, um, and we're seeing it in our more population-dense, um, lower socioeconomic uh, uh, areas. And I think that's probably related to um, the fact that it's easier for people uh, who are independently wealthy or working jobs like, like we do if we're in academia to stay at home and to socially distance. And when you're working in um, the restaurant industry or if you're working in uh, uh, grocery stores or in uh, shipping and things like that, um, you're less able to socially distance. Uh, and, and now that's, those are the places, those population dense areas um, with lower socioeconomic status that we're seeing uh, uh, the real hot spots of, of cases. So, so that's, that's what I have for you guys today. Great, Daniel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you able to unshare your screen? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Great. So uh, now we have the, the geographic perspective and we move to Professor Dana Mukamel for uh, her perspective on COVID in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me try and get my uh, slides up. Um, does everybody see that? Okay. Um, well, I'm glad and thank you for inviting me and I'm glad to be here and share some information with you about nursing homes in COVID-19. COVID I'm a health economist and health services researcher by trade. And as uh, most of you probably know, nursing homes are really the hotspots, uh, the hotspot for uh, the pandemic. And there are really two reasons for that. Um, I guess I should turn this into a full screen presentation. Uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that most of the residents in nursing homes are elderly. Uh, most are above age 65 and 40% are actually above age 85. And uh, they have a large, uh, many, many comorbidities. So they're obviously the, the high risk group for, for getting COVID-19. And on top of that, the second risk factor is the fact that they are living in congregate facilities. Most of them share um, uh, rooms. They eat in congregate facilities. 
uh, nursing homes really don't lend themselves to distance, uh, to physical distancing. So uh, even though uh, nursing home residents, uh, the 1.4 million nursing home residents in this country are less than 1% of the population, uh, they are accounting for uh, a disproportionate share of the number of cases, about 11%, and 35% uh, of the deaths that we have uh, from COVID. Uh, in May, uh, it was estimated that we have 34,000 uh, deaths and about 150,000 people who are infected. But this is really just uh, in 7,700 uh, nursing homes, which is about half of the nursing homes that we have in this country. But I do want to emphasize uh, that these are data from the first two, three months of the pandemic, and the data are really lousy. <laughs> Uh, we really don't have good data from the first few months. Uh, the reason I have, I wanted to share this map with you is because all those uh, states that are gray in this map, which is about half the states uh, in the country, are states that did not collect or at least did not share and publish information about uh, COVID patients in their nursing homes or, or COVID, or COVID uh, death in the nursing homes. So all the numbers that I quoted for you um, are sort of iffy. Um, but since then, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the federal agency responsible for Medicare and Medicaid payment, uh, which regulates uh, all the nursing homes, um, has um, issued regulations requiring all nursing homes to publish, to report every seven days the number of cases that they have to the CDC, and that's starting June, uh, June 1st. So now we actually have data that are published on the web and every, for everybody to see. And nursing homes are also required to report to the families within 12 hours of every new case of uh, uh, COVID, either of staff or residents. So, uh, and we also are starting to see some studies. Uh, there are actually at least three studies that I'm aware of uh, that have tried to look at what type of nursing homes are uh, the ones where you see the uh, concentration of uh, COVID cases. This is a study done by Charlene Harrington from UCSF, and she uh, has done the study on California uh, data. So what she's finding is that nursing homes where you have uh, more, sta more staffing, and in particular registered nurse staffing, are less likely to have uh, COVID patients. Uh, what she's finding as well is, and, and you might ask yourself, if you have a patient that, uh, or a, a family member that you need to uh, place in a nursing home, how would you know about their own staffing? Well, there is a report card uh, for nursing homes on the web, and those report cards report a five-star rating for nursing homes, which is based on the staffing levels in each nursing homes. And that's also was found to be associated with uh, the likelihood of COVID. So those nursing homes who do have five stars are less likely, were found to be less likely to have COVID cases. Uh, not surprisingly, another thing that was found to be associated with uh, COVID cases is the uh, number of deficiency citations that the nursing home has had in the past in terms of infection control. So those nursing homes that have not been doing well in terms of controlling infections, any type of infections, uh, obviously did not do very well in controlling COVID and were more likely to have cases of COVID. And larger nursing homes were more likely to have COVID. And that's explained probably by the fact that larger nursing homes would have more uh, family, family members coming in to visits, would have more patients going in and out. So all of that makes sense. Um, 
so this is a California study. The other studies that have come or have come out uh, have been looking at uh, nursing homes across the country, and as one might suspect, they are also finding a, a connection to where the nursing home is located. So obviously, nursing homes that are located in areas where there is a lot of community um, a, a prevalence of the pandemic, uh, obviously they also have a lot of uh, prevalence within the nursing homes themselves. So I'm gonna stop here um, and let my colleagues continue. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dana, appreciate that. Um, we will now move to uh, outside of the UCI faculty uh, group, and we're going to go to Ed Kasich um, to discuss uh, the Irvine Health Foundation's perspective or his perspective uh, from Irvine Health Foundation. Ed, to you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to all of you who put this together for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to those of you participating for spending a little time. Uh, I, you know, I'm neither a public health expert nor a medical expert. Actually, I'm not sure what I might be an expert in, maybe nothing, but uh, uh, I'm gonna talk more broadly about what we've seen in the community and we being, you know, me, uh, our colleagues at the Irvine Health Foundation our, and our other colleagues, you'll hear about a collaborative thing in a minute, but, uh, and this is beyond health care. This is uh, health, health care, health related and social service oriented stuff because our community has got this interesting fabric. Many of you know this, but I, I'm going to say a lot of things many of you know, including I'm going to give you a brief reminder of what Orange County looks like. Uh, obviously, we have large geography. You saw the maps. We've got about 800 square miles. It's oftentimes hard to get around. Last couple months, it's been easier to get around, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, the reason isn't necessarily a good thing. We have about 3.2 million people, as someone mentioned, and a significant number of those folks work in industries that have been hammered by this COVID-19, service industries, hospitality, you know, restaurants, small business, uh, lots of those kinds of organizations. And um, additionally, uh, even before COVID-19, we had a high proportion of poor people in this county. Uh, Cal Optima, our county organized health system, is the health plan serving Medi-Cal, mostly Medi-Cal, poor individuals in, in the county, and it has 800,000 members. That's one out of four people in Orange County. Uh, uh, those people all qualify for Cal Optima, have two things in common. They're all poor and they're all legal residents. Uh, they're either citizens or legal, uh, legal residents of the United States. So Actually, if I use 800,000 as a measure of how many poor people we have, one out of four, it's undercounting because not everyone is uh, enrolled in our public plan. Uh, not all are eligible. So enough about the demographics. Uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the folks I just described, though, re re uh, rely on a lot of services provided by nonprofit community-based organizations for more than health and health care. Uh, they have other needs, so they may get their needs for a health plan met through the county system, but uh, there's also a vast array of nonprofit community-based organizations providing all kinds of services, including health care and dental care, but also child care, homeless prevention, homeless services, service for older adults, food, all kinds of things. Uh, this group has always had a, a, a shortage or a deficit of resources relative to the need and the demand for their services. Uh, that's been a given. And then came COVID-19. Uh, and we've heard about a lot of different ways people have been impacted and the organizations who serve them. Uh, some of the things we've seen is, uh, as you all know, people were furloughed, schools were closed, shelter in place. Uh, uh, virtually everyone was affected one way or another and, and, the, and the nonprofit sector was, was no exception. Uh, demand for community-based services went up. It always does in a crisis. I've been doing this a long time. There've been a lot of crises, although nothing that looks like this one, but demand and uh, uh, need for our robust nonprofit sector always goes up in a time of crisis. The last one was 08, 09. Uh, there've been several prior to that. Uh, and uh, 
in, in a nutshell, you could say that the, the community-based organizations got, got hit both on revenue and on cost, and they kind of had a triple whammy in each place. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, fundraising revenue evaporated. Everybody that runs a nonprofit will recognize, and I know there's some people participating. Y'all canceled, every, every one of you canceled your spring fundraising events, and oftentimes that's one of the biggest things you do. Those things just disappeared. They were either rescheduled for the fall, next year, uh, whatever. Uh, but the revenue didn't come in. Uh, additionally, a lot of these organizations do have some fee-for-service components, and a lot of that went away ticket revenue, uh, you know, other things, you know, the, the, the organizations often the, the sites were closed or people weren't going or it just disappeared. And then a lot of nonprofits have some contract based revenue and a lot of that went away, childcare, uh, ed educational after school programs, it's gone. So there's this, this hit in three different ways on revenue and that's a big hit. Uh, costs went up as revenue went down. So there was this new reality. Uh, increased staffing costs. A lot of organizations are dependent on volunteers. They're staying home. Uh, some organizations that are heavily dependent on volunteers continue to do their work. Second Harvest Food Bank, and not to pick on anybody, but they went out and hired people to replace the volunteers that aren't coming in. Clinics, the same way. Uh, so cost goes up because now you have to pay for formerly unpaid uh, positions. Delivering services became costlier. Uh, Homeless shelters had to pay for motel rooms because the congregate situation they had didn't allow for enough social distancing. Uh, there was, their congregate meal providers now had to find a new way to provide meals because people can't come together to, this, to the settings in which the meals were provided. And then uh, general organizational costs went up. Uh, clinics had to go find, if they could find it, they had to pay for PPE and other, other organizations found things like that uh, costing more. Uh, Many organizations had to change their, their delivery model. They went, there's tele-everything now. Uh, this is a case in point, I guess, uh, what we're doing. Uh, but uh, uh, remote staffing, remote ser service delivery, uh, but all that stuff costs a lot of organizations money because they weren't doing it before. So they had to procure equipment. They had to train people. They had, uh, it took longer to deliver the same amount of services while they're trying to deliver even more. So costs significantly up. So uh, I'm blasting through this, but I think you get the picture on the, on the bad news side. There is some good news and I will share a little bit about it. Um, a, a group of grant making organizations, the Orange County Grant Makers is an organization that was started about 15 years ago by about six organizations. Ours, ours was one of them. It's now up to a couple of dozen organizations and we work together, share ideas, information. We, we know one another and we, we share you know, the, the goal of trying to make this community a better place. Some of those members, the Orange County Community Foundation, the St. Joseph Health Park Community Partnership Fund, uh, Charitable Ventures, uh, as well as Orange County Grant Makers got together early on in early March and said, we need to do something. And in about uh, five weeks, they raised $4 million in the collective bucket, all of us threw money into a bucket. And the idea was to try to immediately help these nonprofits that were completely hammered right out of the gate. And this is not a long-term solution and it's not gonna solve everything, but it's helping people stay afloat early on. So those grants have all been, been given out. There's been about 162 grant recipients. There were grants were between 10 and $50,000. And it was to support community clinics that were impacted by COVID. It was to support uh, organizations who then in turn uh, make grants to individuals, things like rental assistance and, and, and other cash needs they might have, uh, and to support other community-based organizations who've just been hammered, all, these, all those cost factors that I just mentioned and revenue reductions I just mentioned. And it was designed to triage needs and respond to emergency requests, uh, make things more efficient and effective and, and, and get the money out the door. Uh, I also would say that uh, two other efforts were going on simultaneously. Both are members of the Orange County Grant Makers, so it's kind of two subsets of, of a bigger whole. The United Way has a program uh, focused on individuals. Uh, they're providing uh, $500 gift cards. They've raised about $3 million, and they're trying to keep people from becoming homeless who need to pay the rent and need to do other things that uh, could cause some great negative effects if they don't get done. 
uh, and the and Anaheim. If you could kindly conclude, that would be great. Thank you. I will. I will do that. Anaheim Community Fund also has a fund. Uh, last thing I'll say is that uh, one one of the things we are all working on is a. What are we going to do next? We collectively, the grant makers, because we're trying to build a more resilient, more robust, uh, stronger, and uh, uh, more impactful community-based nonprofit sector. Because there will be another crisis, and they will get hammered again. So we hope we're going to take what we learn here and maybe next time there's a crisis, it won't be quite so bad on the, on the organizations. Thank you. Great. Thank you um, for that perspective. I appreciate it. Uh, now we will move to uh, Dr. Stephanie McClellan uh, to talk about her clinic's experience with telemedicine and what it might mean for healthcare. Stephanie, to you. Well, thank you. I'm really so grateful to be part of this. Um, brief history, my career for the most part has been in Orange County, always frontline. Left academics after my residency, thought I'd be in private practice a few years, go back into academics, but I've found private practice so incredibly demanding and interesting. And having been on the front lines now for 30 years, uh, I feel it, it has given me a real insight into where the gaps in healthcare lie, not only in terms of equity gaps based on gender, socioeconomic status, race, but even for those who have, quote, good access opportunities, the way we have conceptualized and thought about delivering good care, in my mind, has needed to be uh, readdressed for a long time. Um, hence my willingness to go to TIA and be the chief medical officer where we have created a, an alliance, which has been a difficult thing to do between tech and clinical frontline medicine, trying to leverage AI to be able to deliver more personalized care in an accurate and authentic way within the constraints of the American healthcare system. So TIA is based on this premise. This really um, challenges the way that American medicine is delivered in a very siloed way by specialty, which by its very design, um, even though we all share information via EMRs, we have very disconnected ways of looking at any chronic problem and we are attempting with some success to rethink how we deliver care within a concept developed by Dr. Bruce McEwen a number of years ago, looking at psychosocial stress as a root cause of many chronic uh, processes through uh, his description of what he termed allostatic load. So we're trying to look at healthcare more on a group-based what do women have in common? What are the elderly veterans? Much of uh, what everyone knows, what we had to do at TIA with COVID. And it was fortunate for us, uh, in apropos to Ed's comment, we had the luxury of having a fully operational tech team in San Francisco. So even though our clinic was in New York and um, that has been quite an experience riding this roller coaster of COVID in New York from a frontline care provider experience. But now we have a fully integrated platform where people access us through our chat app. We have quickly pivoted to do most of our work on a URL model, but we still have our in real life clinic where we now have unbundled, if you will, the Well Women exam for which the Affordable Care Act afforded all women access. Um, but I have said over a number of years, American healthcare pays for everything but thinking. But now we've been able to unbundle the exam and we've bifurcated the thinking part of the exam to be a virtual online experience and restricting um, the need to be in the clinic for those things that literally must be provided in real life. This was a very interesting thing since COVID started. And again, big shout out to both co-founders of TIA and also to the tech team. We pivoted 
and created a um, URL telemedicine product within two weeks. It is, you know, quickly assembled, is continuing to be refined, but what we have seen is this incredible gratitude and satisfaction from the patients. Over half of our TIA members have used our virtual platform. We have seen a 400% increase use for behavioral health related concerns. What's interesting about that and what surprised me uh, when we opened the clinic in New York and it's been open just over a year, our number one diagnosis in a women's healthcare clinic that primarily has a younger demographic, um, the number one diagnosis coming out of our clinic was anxiety followed by depression. So COVID has unmasked what I think has been an undervalued diagnosis, particularly in the young and healthy. Um, and we have had to triple our behavioral health um, offering within a very short period of time. And luckily, New York City is such a resource rich area. We were able to um, hire really amazing therapists in very short notice. I think this number, I made this slide a little while ago. I think our behavioral health related care is up even from there. Um, so where I think the opportunity is from COVID not to be Pollyannish about this because I've been too frontline too long to um, ever say always or ever say never. But I think we're gonna learn a lot of things from COVID and one of them is there is going to be a community demand for rethinking what services we offer and recognizing that we can do very complex things via telemedicine. And we, I put this in there to say we have a consolidated care delivery model where we are doing very complex things via telemedicine and restricting people's need to come to the clinic, which I think is going to have broad stroke implications for the elderly. Well, actually for anyone, I think we're going to get better compliance because people will have better access. I also think that what Tia has shown is how shockingly unprepared we were for this epidemic on all fronts, whether we're talking about CDC leadership, every big hospital system in New York was staggeringly under supplied in PPE uh, protection for their workforce. And even uh, as was mentioned earlier with our spatial map, testing was so uh, almost non-existent and at TIA we made many of our decisions for intervention recommendations based on the symptoms. We simply could not get enough testing. Thank so you. Stephanie, if you're able to wrap up now, that would be great. I, I did. I said oh. thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So I'm seeing several questions come in. So for those of you that want to solicit other, uh, ask other questions, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, feature on the bottom of the, um, the Zoom window of your options. Uh, but before I get to the Q&A, I wanted to ask the panelists if they had any responses they would like to give. And I'll, I'll just go through the order in which the panelists presented. You can give me a thumbs up or a shake off, but you're welcome to uh, respond if you like. Andrew. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing the other speakers and I, uh, I learned a lot, uh, but I don't have any specific questions. I'm sure the audience has questions for everyone. Great. Uh, Daniel. Same here. I, I don't have other questions right now. Okay. Uh, Dana. Dana. Ed. He's muted, but I think he is. Um, Likewise. Okay. And then Stephanie. Well, two things. Thank you to all the other speakers. I learned quite a bit, but I do have a question for Andrew. So when you look at IgG antibody cross-reactivity for this virus, it only cross-reacts with SARS-1. And I'm wondering why, in your opinion, the clinical profile that we're seeing 
with this is so um, unusual in some ways. And I do understand that we were globally immune naive, but it seems like this virus has presented itself clinically in ways that were unexpected and not seen with SARS, even though the antibody recognition is very similar. Um, well, the, I mean, the cross-reactivity in an ELISA test doesn't really tell you very much about in vivo reaction mm. to, in, to, to infection. So, I mean, that's just occurring. That's just a, a, having to do with the binding constant of the reagents in, in a plastic dish, really. So, um, so, I mean, and that, this is just, it's a different disease. And so it has some, you know, it's some different uh, c clinical characteristics than, than diseases we've seen before. But, um, you know, uh, as time goes on, I think the, I mean, so that's basically my answer. I mean, as, as time goes on, one of the reasons the death to case ratio is declining is that, is that uh, clinicians are pivoting and adjusting to, you know, what's different with this than other uh, causes of respiratory distress. So I think the first instinct was ventilation, mechanical ventilation for people in respiratory distress. And, and what they're finding out with this is that uh, in, in many cases, uh, the best results are actually by trying to hold off on that for a little mm -hmm. bit longer. And so, uh, you know, we're seeing better death to case ratios and, and hopefully that will persist fingers crossed, but um, you, you know, it's a, it's a different bug and with, with, the, with a different clinical manifestation and, and, and we're getting better at, at managing that as, as uh, so I'm cautiously optimistic on that, on that front. Thank Great. you. So it was terrifying in New York for exactly your point, people, especially the hypoxia that was so disproportionate to the clinical symptomatology. And I think I've never seen the medical community as truly panicked as it has been trying to stay ahead of this. But I feel like maybe you're right. The mood, at least in New York, is a little bit of an exhale. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Great. So I'm getting a few questions about, about uh, face coverings and, and, and masks. And I, I wanted to direct this to Dr. Mukamel and, and to think about uh, nursing homes in particular, because COVID clearly has not struck evenly across the age spectrum in terms of mortality. And uh, Professor Mukamel mentioned that some of the five-star nursing homes were less likely to have uh, larger cases. I'm wondering about how, how you interpret that in terms of what are the protections that were put in place, if we could get some insight from that to inform what measures have been effective? Because there's a lot of discussion about what's effective and physical distancing has uh, been argued to be effective. Face masks have been argued to be effective. Um, sanitation, you know, uh, you know, cleaning surfaces. How, what can we learn from maybe the best practice nursing homes? Because clearly they have the highest risk population and might, we might learn something because they're all not only susceptible, but if they get sick, you know, if they get it, they're likely to to have serious morbidity, Dana. Yeah, uh, clearly clinical um, in, infection control is a major issue. And CMS is actually now putting major emphasis on this. Uh, CMS has developed guidelines now for nursing homes uh, to put major emphasis on this. Uh, they're both uh, developing, uh, they're increasing the, uh, the strictness, the, the frequency of uh, the survey of nursing homes in terms of their ability to uh, control infections. And they're also providing guidance and training to nursing homes. There are, in each state, there are organizations whose uh, only raison d'etre is to offer technical assistance to not just nursing homes, but all medical providers. And they have now been instructed specifically to work with nursing homes who have major problems and offer them guidance on uh, infection control. 
uh, there are bills both in the Senate and in Congress that would fund uh, increased infection control in nursing homes. So it seems that most of the efforts is going towards infection control, clearly. Part of the problems that nursing homes had was that they are not at the top of the line in terms of getting PPE. Uh, we all know that that was a huge shortage and none of the, and all, any, any PPE that was available went to hospitals. So uh, nursing homes didn't get it. And I've also been talking to home health providers and they were even in a worse situation than nursing homes. So, um, the issue of uh, physical separation, uh, some nursing homes and some policymakers are talking about what is now being called cohorting, trying to get groups of patients who have uh, COVID into either different parts of the nursing home or even using uh, hotels and dormitories uh, for the patients who do and the patients who do not. Um, but there's really no um, magic solution. Great, thank you so much. So I have another, there's another question from, coming from the um, audience that relates to, um, uh, I think this will, can go for Daniel, uh, you know, this question about uh, the relaxing of certain uh, restrictions in Orange County and especially potential for this being a presidential election year, the effects of political activity, camp campaigning, demonstrations. And, and, you know, to contrast that, you know, when I look at some of the images in Japan where everybody wearing a mask gets on the really crowded metro and we don't necessarily see that many large um, flare ups there, what, what, what can we take away? Do we anticipate that with uh, increased gatherings, especially if there aren't masks. Have we seen that geographically in the data, Daniel? Or would you anticipate that these hotspots would then spread? And, and if so, how, how would that maybe um, relate to what we think of as effectiveness of use of masks? So, so, so that's, a, that's a really complex question. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, there's, there's no easy answer to that. I do think, um, so people being outside by itself is not, is, is not the real problem, right? And, and part, part of the way to break transmission for this bug is, is through increased hygiene, right? So, so washing your hands, properly wearing a mask, things like that, that can cut down transmission by itself. So, so having gatherings of people, it makes me a little bit nervous, um, but if they are, if they're, if they're being careful, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I would worry more about big gatherings indoors um, so if you have big gatherings indoors, no masks, lots of people touching everything, that's, that's the worst case scenario right now, I think. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I do, I do expect an uptick. Um, I think people ha have a right to be out on the streets and angry right now. Um, so I don't blame them. There are other health issues that they're, uh, that, that they're concerned with, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, there, there's not an easy answer. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it shoot through the roof yet here, and I kind of expected it to when people came out the doors. Uh, but, but it also hasn't gone down. It's not, it's not getting better yet. So, so hold on, just be, be ready. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, this question uh, will go for, to, to Dr. McClellan. Uh, this comment uh, relates to the um, increasing use of telemedicine that might be due to some relaxed reg uh, regulations in terms of what can be, um, I'm interpreting that as reimbursement. And uh, what you think is maybe a silver lining that comes out of this, because I know a lot of medicine is fee for service and phone calls don't get reimbursed um, or Zoom calls. How, how do you anticipate this moving forward in terms of really fundamentally shifting or not the, 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 the payment structure and the incentives for a physician to offer high quality care through telemedicine? I think one of the most um, clear revelations in this is that healthcare has been always delivered within uh, the paradigm of what the payers were willing to pay for. And it has always been imputed that the medical world did not want to do virtual care, nor would parent patients be receptive to this. This has been just so elegantly debunked, not only in small clinics like ours, but in many, many, many 
uh, other institutions as well. Just like there's a um, outcry on the streets right now saying enough, we need to be potent about embedded racism. I think that the community at a large is saying we can no longer afford to be sick. We are too sick of a country. We can't bear the burden anymore. We have to open up access. And I think the payers will be unable to retreat from these liberalized um, guidelines. I think they'll continue to be refined, but I do not think we'll ever go back to a pure brick and mortar system. And I, for one, am very excited about that and very grateful for that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. And uh, this can be to whoever would like to answer it. I'm thinking perhaps this is best suited for Professor Neumer, but I, I'm open to others. Uh, there was a comment about the seemingly um, uh, inconsistent messages that come from uh, World Health Organization and CDC about certain likelihood of transmission from different things. So WHO recently uh, mentioned that they that the um, transmission by asymptomatic carriers was rare, and then they pulled back on that announcement. The CDC a few weeks ago mentioned that transmission uh, through inanimate objects or fomites is highly unlikely, but not impossible. And then they pulled that back to then say that that doesn't mean that, um, you know, person to person transmission through aerosols is the only way. Uh, so, you know, with, with this, with the rapidly evolving landscape of what it is we know about this, this emerging infection, um, how, do we, how do we think carefully about um, this this phase two, this process of opening up and what what we can actually uh, hold dear in terms of what's an actual public health measure? Uh, well, I, I guess I will take take that, uh, Tim. Um, I mean, I mean, two two things are simultaneously true. I mean, w one is that the agencies you you mentioned have done a, a, a really poor job uh, at clear messaging and need to do better going forward, and and I and I and both of those agencies that you mentioned. Um, that being said, you know this this is an as as we talked about earlier, a novel pathogen and you know uh, a newly emergent pathogen and one about which we're still learning. As and as the science changes, so does the advice. And I re I realize how frustrating that can be for people. Who, who just want to live their lives and you know uh, do their best to keep themselves and their household members safe, but you know things will change and therefore the advice will change and uh, you know that doesn't uh, absolve any um, you, you know responsibility from the first part of my answer, but you know um, it's just the nature of of, of the beast. Um, you know. I've been saying from uh, the start to wear a facial covering, mouth and nose when you go out in public. And I've been saying that since before the CDC was saying that. I was, I've been saying that since before the WHO was saying that. This is principally droplet spread. Cover your mouth and nose in public. It's the best thing that we all can do. It has benefits for everybody because it interrupts chains of transmission. It has benefits for you because it protects you. And the cost is trivial compared to the potential benefit. Great. That to me sounds like a very clear message. So why don't we end? We're on time. And so I, I do appreciate everybody's participation not only the panelists, but also the audience with their excellent questions. Again, on behalf of the Center for Population Inequality and Policy and the program in public health at UCI, we appreciate your time and take care, be safe.